So to use trap code particular, we need to create a new solid. I typically just call this particular. The color is not going to matter because this will become transparent. But just for organization purposes, I typically make my solid black. Then we go to the effect menu and apply trap code particular. And what you'll see are the default settings of trap code particular. The preview section has a near real time preview of the settings. And we can change the camera view as well as the emitter position as it says right here in the window. Shift click to change the position of the emitter. Now let's move on to the emitter section. If we twirl this open, our first setting here is particles per second. Simply put, this is the number of particles that are emitted for every second in time that passes. After this, we have the emitter type. This defines the area in which the particles are generated. So right now, we see that the particles are coming from a single point in space. And that is because our emitter type is set to a point. We can set this to something like a box, which is a three-dimensional box inside which particles will be generated. Now, if we move down a little bit, we see we have an emitter size X, Y, and Z. Right now, these are 50 by 50 by 50. This is in pixels. So right now, we have particles emitting inside a 50 pixel box. If I set this to something like 500, we'll see that we have particles emitting in a much larger area. I'm gonna set this down to 100. Next, we have a sphere emitter, which is almost identical to the box emitter. It's just that it is a spherical shape rather than a box shape. But we still have control over the X, Y, and Z dimensions of the spherical emitter. Next, we have a grid emitter, which emits particles simultaneously on several points in a grid formation. Now, we don't see this very well right now. So what I'm gonna do is turn down the velocity and what we're going to do is control the speed of the particles so they're not moving from their original point. Now we're going to see the grid formation. So this is the grid emitter right here. And if you're wondering how to control the shape of the grid emitter, we actually have to jump up to the options at the top of the window here and control the shape of the grid emitter with the settings right here. So if I set this to 10 by 10 by 1 in Z, we will have 10 by 10 by 1 in the z-axis here. I can still control the size with the emitter x, y, and z right here. Now in the options, you'll see that we have a setting here called periodic burst. If I turn this velocity back up a little bit, we'll see that on occasion, the particles are emitted simultaneously on the grid formation. One other option we have is to set this to something called traverse. And what this is going to do is emit one particle at a time. Again, I'll turn this velocity down. And it's moving down the grid rather than emitting simultaneously on the grid. The next emitter type we have is a light emitter. Now to use this, I need to create a new After Effects light and I need to call this emitter. Now if I go back into my particular settings and I set the emitter type to light, it will now emit from the position of the light. Now this is very handy. I use this a lot because in particular, our X, Y, and Z controls are set such that we have position X and Y in one property and position Z in another. And this makes it a little bit difficult to control our three-dimensional location of our emitter within the particular interface. So if I set this to a light emitter, my three-dimensional location of the emitter is now set to the light. And this is very handy. I use this all the time. Another cool thing about this is that in our light options, the color of the light will affect the particle, as well as the intensity. So if I turn the intensity down, I can control the particles per second coming out of this light. I can also have multiple light emitters with differing settings. 
So if I set this to a different color here. Now with one use of particular in two different lights, we've got particles emitting from two different sections. So the light emitters are very handy and I use them all the time. Layer and layer grid emitters use a 3D layer in your composition to emit particles. Layer grid emits from a layer in a grid formation just like the grid emitter. So to demonstrate this, I'll create a new solid. We'll make this uh, a blue. Like I said, I need to make this a 3D layer. And I'm going to get rid of these lights right now. So if I set this to a layer emitter, get rid of the lights. And I'm going to rotate this just a little bit. My emitter type is a layer. I need to define the layer that I'm going to use as my layer emitter. So I've got this cyan solid here. And if I turn that off, we'll see that we have particles emitting from the space of the solid. We'll cover this in much more detail later on. So using a layer emitter is a great way to emit particles in 3D space without using your position X, Y controls here and without using something like a box control to estimate where your particles are going to be. Using a layer emitter give you a much more detailed way of controlling where your particles are being emitted. So I'm going to reset this emitter type back to the default setting of point and I'm going to get rid of these extra elements here. Let's move on to the other settings here. So first I'm going to reset my settings back to the default settings of particular. And we're going to cover the direction settings right now. The default setting is uniform. What this means is that as the particles are emitted from a point or whatever we have set, they will move uniformly in all directions. Next we have the directional setting. And you can think of this sort of like a fountain or fire hose emitting particles in one specific direction. Now you may need to adjust the rotation settings to see which direction it is actually emitting. So I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees in one direction and we can see that it is emitting in a specific direction rather than uniformly like we had before. Bidirectional setting is very similar to direction but emits in two completely opposite directions, always 180 degrees from each other in three-dimensional space. The disk setting emits particles outward but only in two axes, creating sort of a disk shape. The outward setting is a little bit tricky to understand because at first it might seem completely identical to the uniform setting. And in fact, if your emitter type is set to point, it will be completely identical. I'll set this to a box setting for now and change my emitter size to a little bit bigger, 100 in each direction. Now if I have this set to uniform, if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that as particles are being generated, they're moving in random directions. They might move to the left or to the right. They might move toward the center or away from the center. It's completely random. However, if we set this to outwards, particles are always going to move away from the center. So that's why setting this to a point setting is not going to have any effect because they're always at the exact center and always moving outward. Next, the direction spread setting allows us to control the area of emission of the particles. Now, let me demonstrate what I'm talking about. I'm going to set this to a directional emitter and we'll rotate this 90 degrees. Now, I'll tap the tilde key to see the full screen particular interface. We can see that this is called the direction spread and it's in a percentage. So I'm going to change the directional spread to 50. So this would be 50%. And our particles will emit 50% of the total area, which is 360 degrees. So we have a potential of emitting particles in 180 degree area, 50% of 360. So the directional spread just gives us a control over how wide of an area a directional emitter will emit. And this works for both directional and bidirectional emitters.
Now, as I've been using so far, the X, Y, and Z rotation controls will control the emitter rotation in 3D space. Specifically, this controls the rotation of the emitter when a particle is born. So if this changes over time via keyframing, all particles generated will emit in different directions over time. So if I change this via keyframing, we'll see that the rotation is at the time of the particle birth. Now to clear all my settings, I'm going to go to my presets here and select zero full reset. The difference between using this setting versus clicking the reset button up here is that this will clear all keyframes and reset all my settings back to their default setting. Clicking reset at this point is only going to reset the settings and then create a new set of keyframes. So the reason we've got this full reset setting right here, and it's actually quite handy, is to eliminate all keyframes and get particular back to the default settings. So let's move on to the next setting, which is velocity. Velocity value represents the number of pixels any given particle will travel in one second. So the higher the value, the faster the particle will move. Velocity random adds a randomness factor to the velocity of each particle, and it can either increase or decrease the particle velocity. Velocity from motion allows us to have the particles inherit the velocity of the emitter if the emitter is in motion. So let's demonstrate this. I'm going to animate the position XY over time. So I'll have this move from one point to another to another. So the emitter moves to the right and then moves down. In fact, let's have this move fairly quickly. Velocity from motion allows the particles to inherit the velocity of this emitter as it moves. So if I turn this up, we can see that as the emitter moves from left to right, these particles here inherit that velocity and keep moving to the right as the emitter was doing prior to that. And then as it moves downward, it will also push the particles in a downward direction. We can actually set this to a negative value so that the particles will actually move in the opposite direction of the emitter motion. So that covers the basics of the emitter section. Let me close that up and open the particle section here. Again, let me select the full reset preset and look at the first setting here. In particular, particles have three stages, birth, life, and death. Essentially, life is the amount of time any given particle exists, whether we see it on screen or not. This control here defines the life in seconds of any given particle at the time it is born. If life is animated over time, any given particle will take the value of life at the time the particle is born. The life random setting can randomly increase or decrease the life of a particle. And this is a percentage setting. So a setting of 100 can potentially double the lifespan or it can greatly decrease it, but will never result in a lifespan of zero. Now here we see a pop-up of particle types to use. Sphere and glow sphere are simply 2D spheres that become the particle image. Below this setting, we see a sphere feather. This is a 0 to 100 value that defines the feathering or gradation of the transparency of these particles. A setting of 0 results in no feathering of the particles. So if I set this to a sphere, I'll turn this up, we basically see a perfect sphere circle with no gradation of the transparency. Glow sphere is almost identical to the sphere particle, but it adds a surrounding glow to the sphere itself. 
And what no DOF means is that these particles will not have depth of field, and we'll cover that later. The sphere feather control will still control the feathering of the particles, but the glow settings are controlled in the options up here at the top. Right here, we have the size, opacity, and feather of the glow right here. And we can also control the transfer mode of how the glow interacts with the particle itself. So it goes without saying that these glow settings are not animatable over time. We cannot keyframe them. We'll only be able to define them at one point and will not be able to animate them over time. Next, we have a star particle type. This is a four point star shape, which also has a glow surrounding it, just like the glow sphere. And it can also be modified in the options I just showed you. Cloudlet and smokelet appear as a cluster of spheres that are treated as one particle. Smokelet is the same as cloudlet, except that it adds a random color shading to each particle, making it more useful for smoke settings. That color of the shading is defined up here in the options as an RGB color value. Being that these are essentially made from sphere particles, both of these particle types have a feathering control that controls a feathering exactly the same way as the sphere or particle. Now the custom particle types are where things really open up and we can use anything we want as a particle, even create multiple particle types to be used within one particle generator. Now we're going to cover these in great detail later on, but now just understand that custom, custom colorize, and custom fill allow us to use a layer in After Effects as a particle type. And as I said, we'll cover this in great detail later on. Let me reset my settings and I'll set my particle type to star. Rotation defines the angle of any given particle at the time of its birth. So if I were to animate this over time, set this to one full revolution, we'll see that each of these particles as they are born have a different rotation control. It doesn't rotate all of the particles at once. It controls the rotation of the particle at the time of its birth. Now, if we don't have any keyframes on this, and I do change the rotation value here, we will see that all the particles would be rotating because we're not changing the rotation at its birth because we're not animating anything. Now, the rotation speed makes our particles rotate over time. This value refers to the number of revolutions per second, so it doesn't have to be very high at all. A setting of one makes each particle rotate one full revolution each second. Also, this can be a positive or negative number. So setting this to negative one will make them rotate in the opposite direction. Typically, I leave this at a very low value like 0.1. The size setting defines the size of any given particle at the time of its birth. The numeric value itself doesn't correspond to anything directly. A setting of 5 does not correspond to 5 pixels. But small values produce small particles, as you would expect. Similar to the other randomizers in particular, size random will add or subtract a randomly generated value to the size of the particles. This is random per particle. Size over life gives us a simple chart that represents the size over the life of each particle. This chart shows a particle size in the y-axis and the time from particle birth to death in the x-axis. When the curve hits the topmost part of the x, that will be the size defined by our size setting, plus any randomness added with the size random setting. You can draw your own chart here, but most of the curves that you'll commonly use are to the right of this graph. I'll tap the tilde key so we can see of all of these. We have a linear graph like this. We have one that allows it to fade up and down. We also have sort of a bell curve like this. And we have a curve that has a, an abrupt drop here at the end. Typically, I use this graph right here. This will allow the particle to size up and then gradually size back down over life. 
So it gives a very natural feeling to how the particle size over time, especially when we're creating settings like pixie dust wipes and all that, which we'll do in our first example. Now, back in this chart here, there are a number of options that we have to flip our chart around or even randomize it. And there's also a smoothing function here to smooth out any charts that you might draw manually by hand. There's also a copy button, so you can copy this and paste this between other charts that share the similar setup. Which brings us to the next section here, which is opacity, which also has an opacity over life section. And I could paste that chart right into the opacity over life. So similar to the size and size random, opacity and opacity random work exactly the same way. So if I set some opacity randomness here, we'll see that our particles have a little bit of random opacity from particle to particle. Now to add some color to our particles, we can do this in three different ways. If I scroll down here, first we can set a color at the birth of a particle, which is the default setting. Right now, each particle as it is born becomes a white. Right now, uh, I can change this to a blue, and all the particles would become blue. We can set a color over the life of the particle, which we would control down here under color over life. If I twirl this open, we'll see a chart that graphs the color of the particle over its lifetime. We tap the tilde key again. So from the birth of the particle to the death of the particle, it will cycle through a red to a yellow, green, all the way to a blue. This is the default color setting, but we've got some other color palettes that we can pull up right here, like the white to blue. So the particles will be born a white, they'll cycle through to a cyan, and then as they die, they'll become that blue that you see in this chart here. This is a very useful one. I use this one a lot. We can also set this to be random from this gradient. So this will still use this chart right here, but it will randomly pick colors from this chart and assign them to the particles as they are born. So these particles can be any shade of this chart right here from the white through the cyan all the way to the blue. Now we can add and subtract colors to this as much as we want. I can just click in the area right below the chart, double click it, and change it to a different color. And we've added a different color to be chosen randomly from the gradient. We can also select a randomness to be added to this color. And what it will do is randomly shift the hue around for each of these particle colors. So we get a lot of flexibility over the color control of our particles from three simple settings here. To demonstrate this transfer mode control, I'm gonna set this particle type to a glow sphere. And I'm going to turn up the size so we see a fair amount of these particles overlapping in space. This transfer mode control allows us to control how the colors blend together when particles interact in the same space. Right now it's set to normal. Now if I set this transfer mode to add, the particle colors will interact using an add transfer mode, or a blending mode as it is called in After Effects. We can also set this to screen or lighten. Now it also has a couple very interesting controls down here at the bottom, which is uh, even beyond something that After Effects has the ability to do, which is to change over time which transfer mode it's using. And again, we have the same type of chart here where we can gradually change how it is interacting. So down here at the bottom, we have a normal transfer mode and up here, the top, we have a screen or add. So right now I've set this to normal slash add over life. So I can have these particles start at add and then over time gradually move down to a normal blending mode. So the particles will initially add together and then over time they will slowly stop blending together and return to a normal blending mode. This is incredibly flexible. Like I said, After Effects even lacks this ability to change blending modes over time. And I think this is a great control. Typically, I leave my particles set to an add blending mode instead of using normal or add over life. 
I like the look of using an ad transfer mode. I think it really adds to the, the color and uh, aesthetic of the particle settings. This concludes the overview of the emitter and particle sections. You'll find that a majority of your adjustments will likely occur in these two sections, and it pays to be very familiar with them. And now, with these two sections covered, we have a good basis to start creating some of our own settings.